I was disappointed. I was expecting there to be 666 participants, so the others haven't turned up yet. Um, so I'm going to start off just by sharing my screen. It will stop the other participants' computer sound share. Oh, no. That didn't happen earlier. Rosie, can you advise? Multiple participants can share. You go for it now. Ah. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, slides. Okay. Cool. Hello, everyone. I am Will. Hopefully, you can see a photograph um, on the screen. Nod if you can. Yes. yes. Brilliant. Okay. I'm Will, and I write to make uh, visual work and about architecture and the places where it sort of intersects with wider culture, economics, politics, and uh, and environment issues. Um, I'm sure you all already know, but the title of this, somewhere between science and superstition, architecture and fear, is taken from a film. Um, Ten points if you know what it is. It's The Exorcist. Dan and Jen, who I'll introduce you to in a moment, got 10 points there. <laughs> um, and I chose that because I think architecture kind of somewhere sits between these stools as well, between sort of the science and the logic and the, uh, the engineering and the, uh, the rules and the regulations and the superstition, which is the art, the history, the sort of the magic and the poetry and sort of the history of the process. And, it, and it's never quite settled between those places. And that's where kind of this third world is created. And that's the same, I think, as the world of horror, which kind of drips in and out of the real and the unreal, the poetic and the, the truthful. Um, so I just mentioned Jennifer and Dan. Jennifer, uh, who says hello, say hello, Jennifer. Hello. 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 Um, is an Academy Award winning producer. I've never introduced anyone <laughs> by saying that before. An Academy, I'm going to say again, an Academy Award winning uh, producer <laughs> based it, in it, London. <laughs> Go on. Cool. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for don't, having me here. Don't talk yourself <laughs> down. And, um, <laughs> and Jennifer, you have, as you know, produced numerous feature films, including Prevenge and The Borderlands. Uh, and also guest Dan Martin who can say hello 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 um, is a special effects expert who has worked on some of independent scenes most notable hits including color out of space and the recent Sundance smash Lords of Chaos uh, which did lots of stuff on Twitter with people shocked and doing their reaction videos I think um, <laughs> yes. thanks to Dan's work um, and I'm friends with them both they both live near me but they also have an encyclopedic knowledge of films um, especially the horror genre and a huge physical and digital archive of many thousands of films, uh, which pre-lockdown, I've often found myself ending up there with some porters or stouts watching. Um, and it was after watching one of those that uh, Dan invited me to talk on his Arrow Films podcast about Candyman, because I kept interrupting the film to mention and talk about uh, American housing projects and Gordon Matter Clark and all kinds of things, which I saw in the film, which maybe he didn't. And from that, we always often talk about sort of overlaps between these two genres and film, cinema and horror. So I thought when Architecture Foundation were doing all these talks, it would be good to uh, offer one because I've watched so many and it'd be great to invite some people from outside of architecture to sort of take part in these conversations and help break the silo down. So what follows is kind of a 40, 45, 50 minute meander through um, some spaces of the built environment, uh, which the three of us find quite sort of scary and fearful. Um, you will no doubt have plenty of others, and you'll also know lots of other film references that we don't bring in, so there's some space in the Q&A at the end um, for those. This picture isn't from a film. Um, some of you might know it's uh, by Louis Dagur, and it's the Boulevard de Temple, Temple in Paris, and it was taken in 1838. Um, it's the first photograph of a human being, uh, because obviously there are millions of people up and down the street uh, in pre-COVID times rushing around, but with a long <laughs> exposure. Uh, the only person which is um, exposed on the film is the man having his shoe shine down at the bottom of the pavement on the bottom left of the screen there. So he uh, unwittingly became kind of this this really important moment in, in film and city and, and also ghostliness and haunting, the absence of those people, the absence of photography has been written about a lot of the death of those people that recorded on film. And if I can press down as well, there we go. Minimize that. This is um, the first yeah. film yeah. of people. Um, and this is by Louis de Prance and it's Grand Hay Garden scene filmed in 1888 in Leeds. Um, what I love about it is this lady here feels, looks a bit like she's floating anyway, so that's kind of a bit ghostly. But this lady here is actually the artist or the scientist's mother-in-law. Uh, she died a week later. Um, uh, she was 72, I think, of old age. And the whole film itself, um, which is the oldest film we have on record, um, it's about 20 frames long. 
uh, is wrapped up in kind of fear and horror anyway. Uh, the, the, the man himself, Louis Le France, went missing um, while he was carrying this over to America for public viewing. And then his son, who sort of took over the business um, a couple of years later, uh, getting ready for a court case against Thomas Edison um, about who owned the rights Ooh. to moving cinema. Oh, Jen has some facts on this. <laughs> no, just, just uh, you, Thomas Edison is not a man you generally wanted to be in a court case against. <laughs> right. I, I, uh, <laughs> put you on a bloody kite. <laughs> yeah, he's got he's got quite the reputation uh, for for you know obviously patent theft and that kind of thing and yeah. um and equally uh, underhanded dealings. So just yeah, I, the second you say lawsuit with Thomas Edison, it's sort of oh what 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 lake did he end up buried in? Yeah. Well, the son was shot dead, so I don't know if that's connected. <laughs> during during the court case, right? Uh, about a week before, I heard, but yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a film. Um, yeah. So let's hit straight into one of these sort of five architectural urban built spaces. And that is, uh, it came to me because we've all been walking and seen seats, streams like this, especially before Boris Johnson told us everything was okay to go out again. And there's no problem whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> this was quite common. Uh, walking Resume through the centre of London. Faces. Resume licking door handles and faces at your will. Um, but the emptiness was something which a lot of people commented on and found quite haunting. Um, references to films like 28 Days Later, um, which I don't think we need much of an introduction to, and we're not going to touch on here, but, but the scenes in the beginning of the film um, where, you know, the sort of this apocalypse has hit London and, and, and everyone sort I, of... Mm. I, have a, I have a soft insight into these abandonment scenes, um, which is that this was one of the first features shot on uh, mini-DV, the dawn of the analogue, uh, like, digital like transition and sort of democratization XL1S, of filmmaking. Is that Can right? A Canon XL1S is correct. Straight into the technicals. Oh, I like this. One in our <laughs> um, so they would, they'd get up at day, like you know, they'd start the shoot at daybreak and they'd literally just shoot when there was no one around. They'd shoot at the very, very first like moments of dawn. They'd do all the prep before, mm. the, before daylight broke and then they'd be ready for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes before we all started walking around. There's a couple of wides where they had to digitally remove vehicles, mm. but otherwise it was genuinely this empty. And, and one take, special, I guess. Yeah, it wasn't special permit. It was just, unlike um, a couple of other examples of this kind of desolation, they didn't have to shut roads off or anything like that. They just well, like moved their time to fit it. And I think, I think that fits in nicely to a sort of more um, emotional or psychological response to it, which is the fact that uh, how uncanny these images are. And I think that follows on nicely from, from the photograph of the man sat getting a shoe shine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're used to these images and somehow there's something missing that makes them feel uh, makes them feel off kilter and it's that absence of people obviously that makes yep. that makes that feeling occur but i love that it's sort of um like these moments of stolen uncanniness in reality uh to go back to what dan was saying but yeah this is this is reality but it's reality at a very particular point of day to yeah. an extent which we've probably all walked the streets pre pre lockdown and had mm. that 3 a.m. sunrise walk or, or something this, where suddenly the streets were empty. And there is something fearful about sort of being the only one in a street which is built and is normally sort of uh, full mm. of so many other people. Um, I was reading that um, J. Headley Neal, who is a, a 19th century British physician um, who, uh, who, who was one of the first writers of agoraphobia, wrote in The Lancet, um, anyone looking out of his window when he's walking alone in a street will think that I'm drunk, flashes through my mind. So I drop a book or stoop to tie a shoelace and then hurry home. Uh, restored by the consciousness that I'm not actually dead. Uh, <laughs> so that sort of fear of being alone and someone looking out their window and saying, well, what's he up to? And, and in a place which is built for lots of people. And, and I certainly felt that when I was uh, sort of walking through Trafalgar Square and I was the only person there. I thought, oh, who's going to come and stop me for being in a place I shouldn't be? It's also, it's not just, um, it's not just visual. It's obviously auditory as well. And places, not only is there the absence of the noise of people in traffic and this kind of thing, but there's, the acoustics is obviously suddenly very different. Mm. And um, if, I, if I, you know, say lonely acoustics, I think everyone gets a similar emotional sense. You know, you think a big empty building. Um, so I think it's interesting the way that it isn't just the visual of the, of the architecture, but it's how the sound interacts with the, with the spaces around it. Uh, yeah, which, 
Mm. Very much Sorry. like this. Yeah, you can hear this picture, can't you? I just, exactly. I'm just going to say, just gonna, because we've got to sort of jump through two films for each space, so we can carry on the talking while the other films drop in the background. But <laughs> the, third, the Third Man, uh, the classic, uh, if you haven't seen it and you're watching, then I was going to say stop what you're doing, but wait yeah. until the end <laughs> of what right, you're doing, wait, then wait. watch it. <laughs> um, 1949, uh, Carol Reed film, which is sort of set in the sort of the um, immediately after the Second World War and Cold War uh, Vienna, when there's lots of different politics uh, sort of contesting for the same space. Again, these uncanny, uh, as Jen says, empty streets and the shadows which are haunting as well. The third man shadows, sort of the shadow as a presence. And then this becomes a bit um, German expressionist y as well, uh, part, partly by virtue of being black and white and being mm. these empty palettes of color, um, but also through the elongation of the shadows. And again, the scale is uncanny. There's, yeah. there's always, it's, it's not a complicated emotion, it's always these one simple little twists that keep it from feeling safe and habitual and protected. The scale, yeah. um, I was reading, sorry, I'll just say, uh, the, Drac the first Dracula made in 1931 from the first sort of uh, mm. uh, um, Universal, were they uh, horror yeah. films? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Sweet. Tom, Tom Brown is one. Yeah, and they built the set to be sort of, as they, as they quote, incomprehensibly large, so a guest room in which the character seems confined and controlled within. So it's a space that actually Dracula can inhabit anywhere at any point. And there's that fear of, I'm locked in this hugeness. And it's, well, it's an outstanding use of scale, exactly. It makes, it makes something feel, you know, you feel like you have a lack of power uh, yeah. just by virtue well, the, of scale. One, mm. of, one of the things that's happening here is that uh, we're seeing a version of the world that the human eye can't see. So mm. you've, because it's being done through a lens, because you can manipulate so many things and then report that image to the viewer, you get, you can create this, you know, whether you're using as, you know, as simple as lighting and, and, and lens diameter, or whether you're going as complicated as using things like split diopter to, to pull things into focus when they shouldn't be, you can create that uncanny, you can create that feeling of discomfort in a space that isn't inhabitable. So you can immediately make the viewer feel alien to the space. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a picture by Di Chirico, the Italian painter, which any architecture people watching will know. Um, it's interestingly titled Mystery and Melancholy of a Street, of a street. Um, and he said of it, there is much more mystery in the shadow of a man walking on a sunny day than in all the religions of the world. Uh, we'll come on to religion a bit later, no spoiler. Um, <laughs> but what interests me as well about the third man is it talks about the city spaces, but it also drops beneath the city into sort of the basement of the city and these subterranean uh, caverns, um, which are sort of sewers and, and the, the, the guts of the city. Um, and there's that sort of that, the, the, as Jen talks about, the sound, obviously, when you go into mm. such spaces, sort of echoes and, and changes around there. I can also smell this space, well, and it's got mm. the same smell of dankness of a cemetery or a cellar. <laughs> well, an old flat or, of or, mine, yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other thing about these spaces is, you know, given that this is set directly post-Second World War, uh, in a city mm. that's been sort of carved up by the victors, mm. the underground spaces during the Second World War were the domain of the resistance. And uh, so these were spaces that were very much inhabited. If you go back to, uh, to like 1945, to, um, to Rossellini's like uh, Rome Open City, which mm -hmm. was shot in during the end of the Second World War in Rome during the Nazi occupation. And that again features a lot of open city spaces because the SS were genuinely policing them and people just weren't allowed out. You know, all these mm -hmm. ideas of curfew and enforced vacancy to these spaces would still have been very much in the public consciousness. Uh, especially in Europe at the time that this movie was made. Um, we could, we could, yes, we've just got to whip on to the next one, Jen, if that's okay. That's fine. I was just going to say, it, obviously, yeah. the canted angle here, making us yes. feel uneasy. And that yeah. very sort of Germanic, um, sort of uh, Dr. Caligari angle. Can no, I, very I, German expressionism. Mm, very German mm, expressionism again. And, and, and yet somehow the called angles. a Dutch, somehow called a Dutch angle, the Dutch of Taylor. Oh. <laughs> so... There's a lot of talk in architecture and urban story to, uh, sort of circles at the moment about like, the future of the high street. And I kind of think this is what it might be. <laughs> at an, at an COVID and at an angle with a pile of rubble <laughs> and uh, empty shop units and nobody there with Amazon with, taking over. Well, the, empty, the vast empty yeah. buildings is something that we're coming into more and more. Yeah. Um, you know, we see a lot of converted warehouses. 
moving on to the shopping malls, mm. uh, I grew up in the American South and we have tons of, ab of abandoned shopping malls um, that opened dur during the suburban booms of the yes. 80s and it, then it, promptly shut at the turn of the century. It's a huge, huge typology now. And I know um, uh, an American writer, Amanda Coulson, I forget her surname now, and that's going to embarrass me, um, is writing a book at the moment on American shopping mall history, which will be fantastic. And there's a lot of good academia and writing about it already. Well, this is Stranger Things, which some of you might have seen. We're not going to talk about it a lot, but it's interesting for me because the shopping centre, um, which is actually used, um, is, as Jen says, kind of a pretty abandoned one. Um, it was taken over by the film set, uh, by the film crew, and sort of turned into a 1980s one, but it, they used like a whole wing of an actual shopping centre, uh, which, um, which was fairly, it was open to the public, but there was just nothing open in that side of the building. Uh, Gwynnett Place, this is the one. So this is what it's like when it's uh, been de-film-setted. Um, well, and so I, I think, yeah, that has, it's, it's, I'm, I'm it, both the transitional space aspect, which I want to jump back to really quickly, but yeah, so this, yeah. this, um, this economic aspect you're talking about, this is something, especially in America, we very much grew up around. Yeah. Um, you know, you'd have your first job in the mall and then by the time you came back from university, it was closed. So that economic disparity is a really familiar well, narrative when that building is seen. It's interesting to think that the, like, Stranger Things is operating on the value of nostalgia. Yeah. And it's nostalgia is very much for the 80s when the mall was like mm. fully seeded in American culture because mm. they had come in and completely displaced all of the local stores, like aggressively, yeah. like thrown out all of these other stores. Yep. Um, yep. Whereas now uh, so many of these buildings are like laying open and empty because the internet has done the same to them, that they are open to be used as, as film locations. Conversely to the film you're going to talk about next, Mm. when they so we were really up against it to film in a mall. Yeah, so I was going to ask you about that in a minute, but just to finish, so this particular mall, um, it's been, it was so empty and sort of fold real life into horror that there was actually a, a unfortunate lady was murdered in the shopping centre, dumped behind, I think, a subway concession, which again, like the whole of that wing of the shopping centre was closed. Nobody found body for another two weeks uh, because it was so depopulated as a space. Well, and then... Mm, yeah, you finish, finish. I was just saying, and touching on the economic side, as you say, these spaces are so empty now. At the moment, this one, uh, the local community and the local council are trying to sort of do all sorts of bungs to try and get people to buy the site and do something to it. Um, at the moment, the latest plan for the, for the um, Stranger Things Mall is that a developer wants to buy and build a 20,000 cricket stadium there, um, well, surrounded by tower blocks. I know, yeah. <laughs> Who'd have thought? But the thing is, so the council is sort of throwing all of these, these sort of bungs and money and offers and changes to sort of the building permits to try and tempt people in, but really, you know, in the current situation, nobody wants it. But there's something fearful for me about architecture, which only lasts about 30 years. Things which are disposable like this, and we'll come out to disposable and destruction and building later on. But this photo here of sort of the tarpaulins and stuff up, you never know in ruins if something's being built or taken down. And there's something edgy and nervous about that. Well, and this there's, is, I want to talk about the mm, transitional space aspect yes, as well, yes. which is, um, and you'll have to forgive me, I, I feel like transitional spaces might be something that architects are much more <laughs> aware of. Than <laughs> they will come at us but, in the questions. <laughs> um, uh, so I won't, I won't speak academically on those, but emotionally, um, if you don't know what they are, it's spaces like a mall or an airport or a waiting room where it purely exists to uh, non places as well, we call space. them. Yep. Say again? Non places. Non we call places. Them. Oh, yeah. And um, I'm reminded of a digital waiting, like when people were in the digital waiting room for Zoom, it kind of, it very much brought <laughs> this to the foreground. Can you have a digital <laughs> transitional space? And do you um, want to just quickly introduce, oh, sorry, Jen, to finish and then. Oh, well, yeah, so that's, that's why, especially for these, there's this automatic unsettling nature to it because it is a transitional space, but then even more so when you find yourself in it, when it is empty, yeah. um, it's yeah. got that extra added list well, of this is wrong. Very, hmm. very briefly before we move on to Dawn of the Dead, I just wanted to say there's an astonishing podcast from 99% uh, Invisible called The hmm. Accidental Room. Oh yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is about uh, a bunch of people living in spaces, sort of between the units in a mall, and yeah. how they basically created an apartment secretly, like quite a lavish apartment in this space, because it, when it's not full of people, it's completely empty, and yeah. the people only go where they're told. So there are all these weird gaps in the space. 
Um, it's a very regulated space. So wh when we see that space empty, it feels very alien. I think too, it's, um, you're forgetting that a lot of American teenagers will have worked in malls. Mm. So it will kind of be the first place that they've seen the behind of, the sort of- The, yeah. the, the behind of places, behind the facadeness we're gonna to touch on in a moment. And that's sort of that boundary between presentable and hidden, the guts and the skin. Yeah, of the, exactly. Of well, and, and with the mall, Dawn of the Dead is a, is a great example for all of this because the mall is a huge part of why the film happened. Um, the, the director's friend, was looking, I think, uh, to invest it. Dan, maybe you could help me out here on the details. <laughs> but basically the director found the location and then said this would be a great place to film a movie in. And the mall itself was actually open during yeah, they the shot filming. It, they shot it over the Christmas break. Christmas so <laughs> wow. they, they were shoot, hiding they, Christmas decorations. There are references to Christmas in the film. Yeah, yeah they'd, they'd film only at night and then they'd go in when the mall, shot, when the mall closed take out all the decorations, pack them away, film for the night, put all the decorations back up, break, everyone slept during the day, and then go back and repeat the, the following day. The special effects <laughs> designer, Tom Savini, um, rather than commuting from home, was sleeping in the cavity under the escalators during the day. Uh, <laughs> thus, <laughs> thus occupying a, a non-space within a non-space. Yep. And in the film, there's that lovely moment when they kind of get so comfortable in the space. Yeah. Um, and I think she, I think uh, the lady says, Stephen, I'm afraid you're hypnotized by this place, all of you. It's so bright and neatly wrapped. You don't see that it's a prison too. Stephen, just take what you need and keep going. Because they'd kind of made home. They set the table, mm. they cook dinners, they get knives and forks out around a table and sit on the sofa. <laughs> well, the idea that it's their second home, it's, it's got everything they need if well, what but, you need is satisfied mm. by capitalistic culture. So. Because, because in the 70s, when the mall was new, that was how the mall was being sold to people. Mm. This is a place of comfort. This is like a second home. You as, as, as the, everything as well you need is here. Yeah, exactly. As, the, as they say from this shot, as you're flying in at the beginning of the film and you see, you could, it's a bit of a blurry image I took from the TV, but you can see the zombies sort of heading through the car park towards the mall. And they say, but what are they doing? Why did they come here? And they, she it's replies, It's the Black Friday sale. That's <laughs> some, <why>. some <laughs> kind of instinct, some a, kind memory, of instinct yeah. a memory of what they used to do. This was an important place in their lives. And that came to my mind afternoon when I saw people queuing for Ikea just today. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> yeah. It's, oh, that's it's, a very telling image, isn't it? This was an oh important place God. in their lives pre-COVID. What are they doing? Exactly. What the fuck are they doing? Um, <laughs> the mannequins, going back to the uncanny that you talk of. Oh, wow. Shopping malls, which are all about these places of show and tell and be and pretend. And well, and this also has the, um, the, the second word, the uncanny valley. Uh, which is uh, the, the, how close something gets to looking like a human or being human-like. You'll yep. notice that in this image in particular, um, you've probably not seen mannequins with eyes quite that shiny in a shopping <laughs> mall before. Those are specially placed in there to give it that extra sense of lifelikeness. Well, so what Romero was doing with these was he was referencing the idea of something that looks human but isn't human, mm -hmm. i.e. the ghouls or the zombies in uh, Dawn of the Dead are like mannequins in that they look like people, but they are not people. Um, I, I don't know whether it's deliberate, and I've never noticed it in the movie, but one of them had a pin in its head, which feels like a direct reference <laughs> to the fact that you could only kill them by destroying the brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this image came to me and uh, we're going to spend a bit longer on shopping centres and some of the next spaces but this came to me because I obviously like every good architect uh, student uh, read Walter Benjamin and his reading on the arcades and Phantasmagoria and sort of the glow of the fetishised commodity object uh, sort of in relation to, to Marx and, and where he writes about the arcade as this series of glass windows uh, which sort of reflects back the viewer who's looking through so they see a bit of themselves in the world which they sort of belong, long to be a part of and then inside are these glass vitrines and sometimes full of glass objects themselves, glass baubles and snow globes and all kinds of decorative objects. Mm. And this really comes to mind um, when I sort of, when I saw when this came up in the film and I, I, it took me right back to sort of the Parisian arcades of Haussmann's Paris. And that's all that desire to just get to these, these fetishized baubles. <laughs> or, or brains even. Um, yeah. But it's, it's also, and you, you know, that carries across into cinema frequently where especially zombie films where the zombie is staring at their own reflection and then you get a rack focus to the, you know, hero trying to hide inside the building. So mm. it's not, it's not a metaphor that's lost on cinema, certainly. 
I wanted to touch back on what you were saying about this sort of this uncanny valley and the pretense because shopping centers as like Margaret Crawford, a uh, great American architectural writer talks about this sort of the otherness of shopping centers. And um, I've got a quote here somewhere. Um, which I will find in a moment, but but they do pack them full of themed things like nature in particular and the way that man has controlled nature and particularly in shopping centres I find fascinating and thinking back to, again, Walter Benjamin writing about um, the Great Exhibition in 1851 in London when, um, you know, we... we we built the great exhibition around the hall. So um, he wrote lightly plumbed palms from the tropics mingled with the leafy crowns of the 500 year old M's. And within this enchanted forest, the decorators arranged masterpieces of plastic art, statuary, statuary large bronzes and specimens of other art artworks. And that's kind of the shopping center, but you know, the, the trees have become plastic and sort of turned into these fake little. Well, they're not always, see, in the, in a, in a, and I haven't been to shopping malls for years, thank God, but, um, <laughs> but I, the, they, I remember them being very green spaces with fountains, and I remember the fountains being the thing that, as a kid, I would go through a pennies in or listen yeah. to the, the noise of, and, and in a way, I mean, in a way, you know, talking about the penny arcades and this kind of thing, it reminds me of the, um, the old brass and glass of the pubs, where mm -hmm. it's a place that you can go, and we want to keep you here so we make it nice and beautiful and grand. So we don't tell uh, you the so time. Stay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we make absolutely. it easy for you to get in. So there's escalators up but not down. We, we put the big shops at the end to draw you in. So there's all these different yeah, yeah, devices yeah. which people in architecture know about how to get you into this labyrinth and keep you there spending. Um, and we'll move on. Yeah, sorry, go. Oh, there's, a, there's a really interesting chap called Lester Gabber who was in the, like from between the 30s and the 50s was sort of responsible in a, an overhaul of how American shops presented themselves. And he kind of, uh, most specifically, he was a mannequin innovator. Um, and was one of the first people to make realistic mannequins that were not a real job. <laughs> so like uh, up until then, the, like, the mannequins were either uh, like plaster, but very deco, Yep. Or, um, or made of wax, but they had to be taken out of the windows in summer because they'd yes. melt. <laughs> um, and Gabba like, was like, no, this isn't how we should be presenting things. This should be a, a space that represents family and like where you want to come, where you go to, to be with people you care about. Like we should facsimilate the home here. Um, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a fascinating chap. And I think he ended up with a, a mannequin uh, that, that became a celebrity in its own right. And he sort of like <laughs> took to parties. Very, very weird man. <laughs> uh, just, just to finish, we're going to move on to the next space. We just finished Jen. You were talking about the fountains. There's a lovely moment in Dawn of the Dead when they find like the isolator switches for the whole shopping centre. Yes. Flick them all on, and like the fountains come into life. The music starts well, up. The lights flicker magical, on, and there's a, <laughs> and it's like and this place like, which was dead. Yeah. It's and you know again, it's something that obviously is is much uh, much more uh, in the foreground for architects when they're thinking about the spaces. But as a as a filmmaker, you know, you want to dazzle, you want to fascinate. So it's it's a natural space for you to be drawn to. I know this church in particular. <laughs> so my, my segue from shopping centers to churches are that they are the cathedrals of commodification and you know, the, sure. the church is, well, <laughs> I, I think they say like the church is the cathedral of religion or something, as some of us saying. But, uh, <laughs> Jen, tell us about this particular church. Uh, so this is a church um, down in sort of Devon, Torquay-ish way. Uh, but it's a it's a fantastic building. It's a little over a thousand years old, which I believe makes it Norman. Um, but it, it was an outstanding space to be. I got to um, climb up to the top of that tower and have a terrible case of uh, vertigo. Just say that you <laughs> produced you produced the film The Borderlands. I did. Yeah. I produced the, so I produced the film The Borderlands, which we shot there. Um, the Borderlands is a found footage film that follows uh, the investigation of uh, representatives from the Vatican who were there to debunk a supposed miracle that occurred there. Literally devil's advocates. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's where the <laughs> phrase comes from, yeah. Yeah. Um, what I loved about this shot, so I put this one in because there seems to be in so many of the horror films I've watched in research for this, this sort of plastic sheeting just appears. Mm. Possibly because in filmmaking it's quite an easy, cheap thing to hang and it sort well, has, has an edge. Well, definitely that. But the <laughs> other thing is, um, it, it, it it's offers... Kubrickian. Well, it offers two things as well. It offers you like a nice, un unsettling sound design, but it also gives you the opportunity for ambiguity. 
yep. what's behind the curtain, what's hidden. Yep. You know, we were talking about it earlier. Um, you know, you have to have a curtain to worry about what's behind it. So, and yeah. that sense, and the sense of the, something in construction or deconstruction well, that's going yeah, up exactly. or going down. Again, a there's, transitional there's, space. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. There's, there's, you, you, you wonder what is, what has been or what is yet to come when you see a, a construction <laughs> awning. And I should say, uh, as we're as we're talking about architecture in this particularly, I mean, this building was stunning, and mm. I I have never been so blessed. I say blessed, uh, uh, you know, gifted <laughs> to be able to spend that much time in a in a monument like this. Um, the bookshelf that's there, uh, that's actually a door to the outside world that we turn into a bookshelf, uh, and with camera trickery into a stairwell in the film. But um, but yeah, every otherwise everything you see in there is obviously uh, well maybe not obviously, except, but everything except you the see cross. There is original. Except oh, and the cross. cross, the cross we put there as well. Um, there's there's this question that comes up in the film. Um, one of you, one of your characters says, "What is present in this place is older than the church." And there's something which is going to happen in the next film we talk about as well, and, and it's present in a lot of horror films, and I think really speaks to a lot of architecture and sort of urban and and or built politics now which is about building over the sites of other things you know we, yeah. we... Well, and this church in particular actually i have got there's no um history to say this is true but it is built on a hill <laughs> it is built on a tour mm. um it was built on the site of an oak tree cove uh and both of those things were really common for ancient sites of worship so mm -hmm. historians they don't have anything to say that it was, but historians um, have every reason to think that it could have been. And I'm not, I'm not going to say what this church in the film is built on, because everyone after watching this is going to go and watch the film. I think it's on one of the streaming channels. It is. Um, it's on all of them, I think, actually. Yeah. Uh, and the there's, Borderlands, a, the Borderlands. There's, a, uh, there's a lovely portents in this shot of Gordon underneath the Christ, mm -hmm. underneath the Nazarene. Um, we're gonna. Oh, there we go. There's a little. I forgot about this slide, which is sort of talking about hinting at some of the, the sort of the logic underneath. Don't what look they at say? this image too closely. We did not make this book to be stared at for this long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will jump on very, very yeah, quickly. Yeah, that's, that's one of those film um, that you're like. It will only be in the background for a moment. In the <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, we're gonna race through. But Dan, do you want to introduce uh, this film, uh, or um, just outline how it connects, yes, maybe? Um, yeah, absolutely. La Chiesa. Um, I'm a I'm a huge fan of this. Um, this it was uh, produced by Argento, who obviously mm -hmm. directed Suspiria, uh, whose music we heard play earlier. Um, and it's a uh, it's, oh, it's sort of right mm -hmm. right at the end of the of the 80s horror from Italy, uh, when they were trying desperately to sort of push into the American market because that was where the money was. So it's an, an English language Italian horror film. Uh, and other than a little bit at the beginning, that's uh, a sort of a flashback to the Knights Templar, which were a regular yes. obsession <laughs> with Italian cinema at the time. Um, it almost entirely takes place within this church, which I think, Will, you told me, which I hadn't realized, is not the same church that we see on the outside. They're different buildings. Is that but right? Not, not the inside, but we will yeah. see towards the end of these slides, uh, something happens to this church. That's, that's a different church we're looking well, at there. Oh, oh yeah, this is a demolition, man. They didn't throw <laughs> in a church and then blow up. But it's quite, quite evidently <laughs> a, a totally different piece of architecture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, architects may have picked up on that, but not as filmmaking now. Um, oh, some also, plastic sheets. It's, it's important nerds. to say, too, that a lot of, um, not a lot of filming goes on inside churches. A lot of churches you mm. see on cinema are going to be sets for very obvious yes. practical yeah. and um, cultural reasons. Um, so when you do see a film that's actually made at a proper church, I, 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 so not everyone will it's, agree with this, but I do think it has a different um, tone to yeah. it. Mm. Um, well, because whether or not you yourself believe in the power of that building, other yes. people do. Yep. And I well, think that transference of power occurs in the architecture, if that yeah, makes sense. There's, there's definitely in the mood. That, but on, t on top of that, there's a genuine acoustic effect from shooting in a mm. church that just is, is mm. so hard to Stunning. get right when you're faking it in sound design. Uh, as Dan and I watched the, um, the Innocents projected in a church down in Camberwell, and it was mm. un oh, yeah. A yeah. absolutely unintelligible because the acoustics <laughs> are designed for choral resonance rather than... Rather it was than kind of amazing in a different way. It was sort of an avant-garde experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But then the other thing is that, like, you know, the church, obviously, like, churches in general, if they're still in use especially, have quite a lot of, like, 
quite a lot of opinions about what you might want to shoot in them in, the, in <laughs> yes. a church and the and the kind of film that wants to shoot in a church versus the kind of film that churches wants to film in them uh is going to be somewhat disparate there was but, a yeah. sorry no no i was just going to say was, um, the, 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 there's the, the connection between this film and the, the, the Borderlands, which starts before, which, which goes back to what I was saying about sort of this layering of architecture over sort of others, other people's histories and meanings. Um, we, as you mentioned at the beginning, the beginning of this film um, sort of touches on a, on a history of the site, which is unearthed through the narrative which unfolds mm-hmm. in this yeah. film. And these monks, and that, it Here made me think, I'm just going to race through the next couple of slides, but th- this scene in particular with yet more plastic sheeting as there's some restoration going on in this church um, reminded me of uh, the sort of the mythical monk of um, John Soane's museum where he built um, mm. monks, monk's court out the back where he had um, G- Giovanni, uh, Padre Giovanni, I think, um, sort of a, uh, what did he, he call it? So this other space at the back, which is, which is an imagined sort of ruins using fragments of Westminster. Um, a medieval monk who supposedly lived in the, in the parlour and sort of wrote a tongue in scre- tongue-in-cheek description. Uh, his faithful companion, the delight, the solace of his leisure hours, um, sort, of, sort of existed in the ruins of, of, of John Soane's sort of collection. Um, and those monks there sort of made me think of him. And just to touch on another architectural reference, this is um, when I, I worked on it briefly, Strawberry Hill uh, Villa by Horace Walpole, who obviously a king of horror, uh, having yeah. the, the castle of Otranto, which is based upon this house. Which uh, I'm rereading at the moment. <laughs> ah, perfect. So yeah, um, I will tell you about the lead work detail on the roof if it helps you understand the story. <laughs> the um, <laughs> so the castle of Otranto, which is a great read and, and was remade as a, it was made as a film by Jan Svankmar, a lovely little anim- semi-animation. Um, so this is where horror started. Mary Shelley read Castle of Otranto, Frankenstein followed, and then this whole sort of um, gothic revival happened uh, this touches on the end of the film which is um actually in hamburg i think um a very very different church to the one we saw um it, it's not much of a spoiler the church collapses but uh, it's worth watching the film a lot happens before then <laughs> the film came out a long time ago we can do fun, this, can't we? Fun. yeah I, I, well, there's a there's a film in the in the roster that i'm gonna try and force you not to talk about beyond the first act because it's too modern but we can spoil it yes i think i know which one you mean we're coming on to it shortly um as we move into our next space talking of the under spaces the underneath of the city underneath of architectures of the histories that go beneath the cellar and what happens in the cellars uh so mm. i I find just as we as we transition from church to cellar i find it um I find it really interesting that one is a pay, is a space, uh, the church that we give a lot of power sort of culturally, and then the cellar has a huge amount of power metaphorically. Yes. Um, cellars cellars are are inherently only creepy because of the metaphor they give us of this underneath and this hidden and this forgotten space. Oh, well, as and, the, mm. and the cellar is kind of an uber space for all of these others because there are very few of the movies that we talk about in this film that don't have reference to the cellar, that don't have reference to an underground space. Dawn of the Dead doesn't go underground, but, mm. but by and large, I mean, we but were they talking do about in, the obviously tunnels. in its predecessors. Yeah, they do well, in well, and, Night Living and, Dead. Yeah, Night Living Dead has a cellar space. And then obviously almost all of Day of the Dead happens subterranean. Um, and, and then, uh, yeah, talking about things like Third Man, with all of those underground tunnel spaces, mm-hmm. like the, the the underground is always a way of upping the ante as far as discomfort goes within a, so, an environmental space. So, as Gaston Bachelard wrote, um, which every architecture person watching will have, have read, I'm sure it's uh, university. Uh, as for the cellar, we shall no doubt find uses for it. It will be rationalised and its convenience is enumerated. But is is it is first and foremost the dark entity of the house, the one that partakes mm. of subterranean forces. When we dream there we were in harmony with the irrationality of the depths. This is the place of trauma. It's the place of, you know, it's where in Germany, every family that was given Mein Kampf but can't cut you know, they keep it in the attic or the basement, out of sight, out of mind, but they don't quite want to part with it. It's a part of a, a family history, good and bad. It's where you put the things you want to sort of not remember, but not forget. Well, it's, it's also where people used to store the dead because it was cold. You know, you had your root mm. cellar, which was to preserve food. But if you had a member of the family die, the body would go into the, into the cellar. Jen and I were in Brno over in Checha recently. And, uh, and they had a huge network of tunnels running underneath the city mm. that would allow them to, to carry all of the fresh fruit and vegetables around this you know, largely market city. Um, 
but then peppered around it, they've got ossuaries, and then like going right back to the birth of the city, they've got sort of monastic burial spaces, which mm. are these just massive <coughs> subterranean open rooms full of these naturally desiccated corpses that are still, well, you know, still preserved. Again, of your romantic holidays. It was an anniversary, it's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's also, um, I love, I love how, uh, and again, the architects probably know more about this, but the, the way we don't light a cellar particularly well, because we don't intend to be down there for particularly long. Mm -hmm. It's not a space that invites you to get comfortable in it. You don't put your soft beanbag chair in the cellar to go hang out. Um, and, and the cellar, the cellar being the emotional antithesis to the basement in a way, you yeah. know, people hang out in their basement, like in that 70s show but please don't send me down to the cellar. So um, in, in this film, uh, which I encourage everyone to watch, it's on YouTube, it's a fantastic short by Anne yeah. Frank Meyer. Um, the girl is sent down to the cellar just to get coal, and, or get potatoes, I think. Get um, potatoes, yeah. Which yeah, is yeah. part of his sort of the, his, his childhood memories, actually, because um, collective housing did have shared cellars, which is where they would keep us, they would keep bodies, you say, because it's cold, they would keep food as well. So, and coals, that's where they were sent down. And it was this space of childhood fear and memory. So I encourage you all to watch that. But a film some of you will have seen, which we are not going to give any spoilers about, which is also set in cellars, mm -hmm. uh, Parasite, which came out more recently. I'm not going to say much about it, because if you haven't seen it, you should. Yeah, it's it's astonishing. It's uh, like one of the big, like one of the big things. Obviously, without going into too much detail <laughs> about Parasite, um, it's essentially a, a a movie about class disparity. And as you can see from this image here, there's uh, there's a, a a working class family who live in one of those like split level semi subterranean spaces. So all their windows are kind of like chin high, looking out onto the street. Um, and then you've got this family who literally live up on a hill, uh, mm -hmm. and then who have a who have a basement that plays a very different purpose. Use of the... steps and height and verticality yeah. in the film is astonishing. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, as demonstrated by the poster, like the alternate poster that you had on the previous slide, like you've you've literally got the the idea of the the rich family who have this this cellar that is like you know just shove stuff down there. It's not where we live. And then you've got the working class family who are forced to live in that space you know well yeah and here we go you know there's a there's a big rainstorm in the movie and, and, and an entire neighborhood that at least partially exists in this semi subterranean space uh, mm. is, is massively negatively impacted which because takes, of the architectural choices which takes me right back as yeah. i was watching this i just had in mind um both engels and henry mayhew in the 1840s wrote about sort of the the, the conditions of the working class in britain in mean, particular in uh, places like manchester and london the industrial centers where people would live in cellars and henry mayhew wrote um not only the cellars, but the first floors of all the houses in this district are damp. Um, that a number of the cellars once filled up with earth have now been emptied and occupied once more. That in one cellar, the water constantly wells up through a hole stopped with clay, the cellar lying below the river level, so that its occupant, a handloom weaver, had to bail out the water from his dwelling every morning and pour it in the street. And you would get sometimes four or five families living in basements with no light, which would regularly flood with sewage and water, because that was what the economics, economics of the day kind of demanded. Well, we're we're only a few steps away from it now. There's so many of the of the old houses in London still have those semi subterranean uh, yeah. spaces, and they're often the kitchen as well, which is interesting because it's cool. Um, so I'm going to jump onto just quickly touch on this yeah. guy, which um, some people will know is the Mole Man of Hackney, uh, William Little, um, who was. Uh, uh, was found a few years ago, I think, to have been digging huge numbers of tunnels under his house, taking like completely taking underpinning, uh, taking away the underpinning from the, all of the neighbouring houses. I the didn't house... know we could do that. I well, he just... couldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> wasn't meant think... to. Jim, where do you think our swimming the... pool is? <laughs> <laughs> the house actually has just been bought by the artists uh, Tim Noble and Sue Webster, and David Adjay is in the process of turning it into some more of a luxury. Um, property. But talking about basements you get now, this is the kind of thing that's more common. No, not quite on this scale, but if you go anywhere in Clapham, you'll see loads of these kind of machines which are pointing down into the basements of properties underneath living rooms, it's constantly yeah, there's sticking a, there's out. A, there's a name for this, isn't there? It's, uh, it's like down expansion or something. Yeah, <laughs> this is more like iceberg, iceberg basements, yeah. yeah. Um, ones of this scale, which are just obscene. But there's something here about the hidden world underneath, which I think is quite fearful for me and about they, what that means about wealth disparity as well they, what do they keep in that space under the swimming pool 
<laughs> Spare water. <laughs> Hor horizontal worker children. Going back to what Bachelard wrote, he said the cellar dreamer knows that the walls of the cellar are buried walls, uh, that they are walls with a single casing, walls that have the entire earth behind them. And so the situation grows more dramatic and fear becomes exaggerated. Uh, we have to move on. We've got one more space and I'm really keen to leave like five, ten minutes for questions. But there's lots of really interesting. Like Brad Garrett's new book on bunkers is going to be really good about talking about basements and the luxury of basements and prepping. Uh, Max Colson, the artist, has a brilliant short film about these kind of iceberg basements too. So there's a lot of architectural discourse um, about these spaces. But the basements which you know, I'm more scared of, but the ones in the suburbs, the ones where the Fritzels and the uh, Shipmans live, you know, place, people like that. Light. <laughs> hey, the world's good at the moment. Just, just wanted, if I ever needed some cheering up. Uh, Dan, do you want to just briefly mention this film? I think you have a connection. Uh, yeah, off the, off the back of the, the film Will mentioned uh, at the beginning, The Lords of Chaos, I got a role uh, designing the makeup effects and creature effects for a girl on the third floor which is uh, a sort of an interesting little uh, picture. It was uh, developed based on a, a UK screenplay from a director by a friend of mine and Jen's, uh, written by a, a friend of mine and Jen's uh, called I, ben I actually Pearl, developed it ben for Parker, several years. That Jen, was, yeah, that Jen was on the development team for. Uh, Queensbury Pictures picked it up because it coincided with that. The house that was in the, the previous slide um, had... Uh, had a uh, like a reputation in the local area in the suburbs of Chicago as a haunted house, and um, one of the producers from uh, from Chicago had bought a house diametrically oh, opposite yeah. from it mm -hmm. um, as a as an investment property. And so when this house hit the market, they thought, well, why not buy it, do a horror film in Chicago's most haunted house, and then. Decor redecorate it and sell it so we ripped a lot out like a, a lot of this stuff like the, the sconces <laughs> were sculpted for the shoot whereas that weird speaker underneath the sconce uh, the lighting the little light thing is uh was original feature and well, not mm. original feature you know yes. it was there and the house was purchased an but, original uh, american feature <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah but all of them when it was originally stuff, built over 50 years ago <gasps> yeah Imagine. It's, it's uh, antique from American, so it was made in 26. Make a light. Uh, 2006. Uh, the, the, in the film, the, yeah. But yeah, so this, this character here, played by uh, CM Punk, uh, who was a, a, a wrestler making his way into acting, um, is doing up a, a derelict house. So we had a lot mm. of fun ripping holes in walls. Plastic sheeting. Yeah. Talk, of talking of holes in walls. Yeah. Hey, there we go. <laughs> finding finding the bodies of friends that have gone missing uh, in holes in walls. Um, yeah, it, it's very much uh, sort of carrying on the tradition mm. of the next film we're going to talk about, yeah, the which last is film, uh, yeah. a, a house a house that is so haunted that has developed an agenda. <laughs> I'm just checking, just so we keep it on time. I think we've got four minutes left. I've got the timer sure. in front of me. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, I'm just reminding so, Dan more than anything. I think. <laughs> but what I love about this kind of film, and also it comes back to there's some lovely shots in this film of like him doing the DIY and smashing holes in the walls and things happening around the other bits of the house and in bits of the house you can't see. It's this interstitial space. So it's not even a basement or a, a cellar. It's not kind it's of in the walls. Extension. We, we do, we do go a, into the basement. We do go into the basement. You do, but, but, but it's these different. kinds of spaces. It's the spaces you're not meant to have any in it's the bits where there's meant to be you know bits of architecture and cladding and you know well, so the houses, it's like the TARDIS effect isn't it like mm. where it's it's um well it's like that sorry John where it's uh like the house of leaves like the house is bigger mm. on the inside than it is on the outside but well, something like the most, I think is interesting place, about yeah. this piece as well is obviously there's a lot coming in and out of the walls in this film but this film like many others has those sort of walls that bleed giving the giving the house an actual vitality um which yeah, well, takes us onto a bleeding wall <laughs> I, mean, these, I, the... I have to tell a quick anecdote here Do, please, uh, yeah. which is that the very first feature i was shooting which was in a beautiful um old estate house uh in in near cornwall um uh we did this huge scene in the bathtub upstairs where someone gets their throat slit and there's blood everywhere we're just running it down the sink and running, running it down the bath running it down the bath typical day at work yeah as one does um and the next morning i open the door to my office which is the room below the bathtub and somehow in this old house shocking shocking electrics the bath water the bloody bath water had run through the ceiling through the ah. light fixture down the hanging light bulb and so 
just there's blood dripping off the hanging light bulb. And you shouted, you shouted, well you shouted well. get the camera now. <laughs> it had, it had run into the, into the glass of the filament light bulb. Yeah, and it was just dripping. The whole thing was just yeah. dripping down. It was out, well, it's old house as well, so God knows what was wrong with it. But uh, yeah. But yeah, absolutely but outstanding. When walls I know, bleed. I know we're low on time, but I just wanted to run back a, a few frames to the creature climbing out of the wall from uh, from Girl on the Fur Floor and point out that that is an entirely false wall that mm. we built in the real house. Wow. Because obviously when you're working on a film, uh, you can do stuff like that. Uh, and so that actually is a press latex panel. It was lovely how it happened. You should watch it, this film, everyone, and see this emerge from the of, wall. Instead of a wallpaper, like wall, a painted wall. Uh, so yeah, like, you know, it, being able to use a single edit to transition invisibly between a real space and a built space uh, is, is one of the best secret weapons of a genre filmmaker. Going back, as, a, as one often should to Bachelard, as I just mentioned, but he wrote of houses, uh, he said, but in addition to the intimate value of a, a house in a big city lacks cosmicity. For here, where houses are no longer set in natural surroundings, as in suburbia, the relationship between house and space becomes an artificial one. Everything about it is mechanical and on every side, intimate living flees. It's this idea of the, the facade and the pretense of normality and manners and neighborly goodness. But what looks within, you know, is this, uh, this more fearful. There's a quote in the film which says, but houses don't have memories. And I think we keep going back to this. They do. Places have memories. When, when you're fracking or building pipelines over, so or blowing up mines on 46,000 year old Aboriginal sites, there's memories oh, yeah. in that place. You know, architecture, when they put down, there is no such thing as a tabula rasa. I think a lot of developers forget that. But, but houses do have memories. Um, another basement. And we're going to finish, I think, on this slide, talking of more blood walls. <laughs> How did you get into my house? <laughs> <laughs> it was before like, COVID. Before COVID. I like, I like that you've ended on a Stuart Rosenberg film, uh, given the recent references to Cool Hand Luke in British politics. And that Rosenberg directed both the Amityville Horror and Cool Hand Luke. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know if anybody sent any questions because I'm. I'm still working out how to use soon. I've just seen a message from Architecture Foundation who say this is great. Don't worry if it runs <laughs> over. So that's a good sign. I don't know. If, I hope the participants think the same thing. Side. If there are any questions. Um, send them well, through i guess into talking, the chat space the personified uh, no question yet for those questions um the personification of the house um mm. and just the idea that uh the house itself might have some kind of animosity towards someone um uh it's it's one that um that you see a lot in horror films the idea that the space itself and it's always that domestic space is turning against domestic. someone and, and yep. often a family unit. And, um, and when you get into suburbia, uh, a lot of times you see like the Burbs is a fantastic example of the subversion of the suburban <laughs> utopia, right? Yes. Um, uh, that you, if the space is so constructed and so designed that that one tiny element that suddenly seems to be off kilter turns into a, a falling dominoes and it just exponentially grows mm, until the whole world of, falls sideways. which is the psychology of humans as well as buildings and i think often the, the psychology of that for me often overlaps um there's so many films we could have talked about especially talking about domestic interiors like rosemary's baby uh the architecture of, yeah. of that and there's a lot written about that but it's also oh, we have a question history as well yeah right, i'll throw this one straight at the two experts uh who are with us. Where are the frontiers of horror and architecture? What's next? I think this is two questions in this. One, what's next as in, what's the future of horror? And also, what's next? What films are you working on, <laughs> guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so, I th uh, Dan, you go first, I'll think. Uh, okay, uh, I mean, I think there's, there's a general uh, feeling in the film industry, not just in the genre film industry at the moment, that we're all looking at making films for a world that has to exist beyond what we've all just gone through or what we're still going still, through. Still, still, and about yeah, to exactly. peak two, yeah. And about to peak two. Um, and, and so like the idea of narrative is very different, but also the way in which we relate to our built spaces is very different because we've all been confined mm -hmm. to the places we live in for mm -hmm. a long time. So I think we're gonna see a big uh, like uh, rise in single location cinema 
uh, specifically set around a domestic space or an abandoned space. Um, uh, and, and I think probably like a relatively like low cr like cast count as well, just because any films being made uh, in the near future are, are going to need that. Um, and it's, I think, you know, as Dan says, to some extent, we don't know at all what the future is going to look like, and that's all we do know. But um, I think the notion as a, as a filmmaker of all of these spaces suddenly being empty because people can't afford uh, the commercial space mm -hmm. or aren't using offices in the same way. Um, that fascinates me because it means the ability to go film in these empty spaces so much more. Um, but then obviously, conversely, we'll probably end up in studios more just because they're more controlled environments. Yeah. So yeah. I think simultaneously, we're going to see a real, a real division between um, studio shoots and on location shoots. Mm -hmm. Well, I was, I was told today that uh, despite the fact that um, like I would, I had assumed that very little was happening in the development world. Um, that we were, that apparently loads and loads of de development funding is being passed through because the number of people applying has gone down. And I don't mean in a filmic sense, I mean in, a, in an architectural or space development sense. So loads of spaces that were like waiting to find out if they could like rip, them, rip things down and, and build again are actually being, now uh, are, are being signed off on just because the, like, it, it's not that the number is going up, it's that the ratio between applications uh, and sign off has gone, has dramatically changed because there's a lot of stuff being being developed. Well, and, and, and again, just strictly from, as Dan said, from a filmmaking perspective, um, we're gonna have to find ways to be more creative than just having people in empty spaces by themselves. We'll get two or three of those, but people are gonna have to be so innovative. It's gonna be I really mean, interesting to see that. Architecture is wrestling with similar problems. Yeah. I think, but I think it'll, it's, it is, it's gonna be, okay, so do we put people in bubbles? No, that's dumb. Okay, so what do we do? Let's have <laughs> 10 Zine bad say, ideas. Zine have oh, given yeah. us 20 different mask options we could use, but I think um, they're all a bit crap. Someone's asked about hereditary and the- ah, You saw, the, brilliant, yeah. Um, so so I'll, read it, I'll read it out. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Askin has asked everybody, has asked us actually, uh, what did you think about the house's role in hereditary, which I'll have to defer because I've not seen it, if that's an appropriate film to discuss? I, I think it's um it's spectacular. It's a house with a with an evil attic for once. Um, oh. but the attic is full of secrets and then it's got this exterior treehouse space, which is not dissimilar to the way we've discussed a suburb. You know, a, a treehouse is meant to be this child's like escape, but it's it's very perverted uh in the film. Um I think, and sorry. And and then um my and this is not gonna be a, a spoiler, but my my absolute favorite thing about the house is the way they use the vaulted ceilings in the living room. Um, they've got these amazing um, uh, support beams across the straps of the ceiling and it allows for nooks and crannies and shadows and sort of that same kind of um, uh, German expressionistic kind of filmmaking mm. we were talking about before. And the so Horace Walpole, the Horace Walpole the, gloop that we talked about as well. One, yeah. of, one of the ways in which they play with the home space as a, as a narrative piece in Hereditary is that because the mother character is an artist who works with miniature representations of domesticity and of home space. Dolls, dolls um, houses, yeah. Well, yeah, like, yeah, to, 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 <laughs> like Models. she would she would complain about them being called dolls houses <laughs> as a character but yeah like but the but she has like when we when we come into her world she has 100 percent control over those spaces and the film is about stripping that control away from the real version of those spaces for her as a character mm. so so we get to play with the idea of uh, of what a home means to a homemaker uh, and it's something that's meant to be under your control it's meant to be a safe space and and that real horror exists within stripping that control away from people we we have um one last so the person asked a question sarah said yes i was going to mention that the initial scene set in the doll's house metaphor thank you great talk um we have two questions which i'll fold into one because we've only got time for one more question so the two questions are one fearing from horror although i think full of fear in many ways um i wonder if shaq tati's use of architecture could be spoken about i mean there's some excellent books and films and academic writing and all sorts of things and also exhibitions i was, I was talking to um 
uh, curator at Maxi in Rome about Chak Tati earlier today, and they have an exhibition of uh, of his work coming up. Say that slowly um, now. Where where is it? Um, it was Maxi in Rome was talking about go. it. Okay. Yeah, um, James Pico who's asked as well. I'm not very well read on the subject, so if it's not relevant, ignore me. Never. We won't ignore you. But there was some interesting things happening in video games. Dan, I don't know if you know anything about this. Oh, in wait, the I horror and architecture. Games, and Jen has made Jen video games. Yeah. I can't help but think of the house hallway in PT and how iconic oh. it it's become in a horror game community. I have, Oops, this sent I have private a... individually. So there's these two questions: Jack Tatty and digital computer video games and sort of the, the worlds which are being created. Can I can I do Tati and then Go for it, Dan. Go for it, yeah. for games? Uh, I, Tati's really interesting because like a lot of his like gentler, more accessible films uh play around with the idea of communal spaces, especially like like the holiday of Monsieur Hulot like plays around with a place that is only occupied by people who are there for leisure. Mm -hmm. So there's uh there's a like an idea of frivolity and freedom within it. But then if you look at stuff like Playtime, which is this sort of like slightly peculiar, absurdist, like futurist space, it's about like how other people, like the people that build spaces might have a different agenda from you about how what they <laughs> want from a space is going to be different from what you need from it. Architects? Who um, <laughs> knew? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed. I love Jacques. I love Tati. He's an incredible, incredible filmmaker. Um, and yeah, Jen. his relation, his relation to the space around him is really fascinating. I'll give the I last think, words to Jen talking about. Yeah, talking I think that leads games. nicely into games actually, because the way you have such control over the world you're creating in games, and um, for the most part, you have to be able to defend your choices. You can't just do something because you have to have chosen a design, either for budget reasons or because you've got a damn fine uh, psychological support behind it. So. Um, all like I, uh, game designers, we architect design books, architect philosophy, all the same kind of stuff you guys do. So I wouldn't be surprised that more so in film, where you are beholding to certain buildings um, and, and using them not for their original purposes and this kind of thing, when you design a space in a game, you literally are designing it from the top to the bottom. So those conceits get much more folded into that design process than they do because then they can in a film. Um, but I would say too that, um, you know, I think horror games, again, coming into not just giving the spaces their floor plan, but giving them their textures, their sounds, their lighting. I think all of that is coming so much more into it now that mm. spaces are only just becoming more than black boxes in and about the last five years. Three-dimensional well, and soon to, haptic as well. To, yeah. Exactly. To, quick, to, to quickly address the PT aspect. So uh, for those that don't know, PT uh, stands for Playable Trailer. Yeah. It was a short game that was released for free on PlayStation. Uh, it's now been taken off the PlayStation Marketplace, so you can't download it anymore mm. if you have a machine that uh, has it on, it's worth a lot of money. Um, <laughs> it was a collaboration between Hideo Kojima, who's famous for um, uh, the Silent Hill mo uh, games and um, uh, Metal Gear and uh, uh, Guillermo del Toro. And they were gonna collaborate on a reboot of the Silent Hill games before Konami kind of fucked that all up because they're idiots, absolute idiots. Um, <laughs> Uh, Bringing it back P to the point, then. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so PT, PT was an amazing uh, trailer that existed in one square form circular corridor, uh, but it was wow. built as a non-Euclidean space. So, uh, but this wasn't, you weren't told about this. So every time you did a lap, you just have it, to would figure subtly, it, out. it would subtly change and the direction you moved in it would affect how it developed. So um, the shining so what, corridor. <laughs> well, yeah, so, yeah. Exactly. So what, what it was doing was it was taking the concept of roguelike games, which develop procedurally generated levels and presenting you with a split narrative space that would create a new level from a specific list based on your actions. And the actions weren't just your movement. It could be the amount of noise you make because the well, microphone was active during the and game. And I think then, I think too, amazing space. as it relates to space, as I was saying, you know, PT gives you this black box kind of world. And that's what horror games and horror game design can do with that little information. Yep. So, so taking it back to that, what we're going to see down the line, I think is just going to be gobsmacking. There's some great non-Euclidean uh, non uh, stuff out now that I just can't wait to go get seasick inside of.
there's a, there's a, <laughs> anyone who's interested, there's a VR game the officially produced for the Oculus Quest headset has to be side loaded in, so you've got to like jailbreak your headset. But it is a it generates a maze in the this? space that you're in that occupies a, va- a much bigger space than you're in. So it creates a uh, a non Euclidean geometric maze within your game space that allows you to move around a, a vastly larger space than you're actually walking in. So okay. it, it tracks your environment. We're going to have to, it's okay. We will, we will wrap that up, but that seems like the perfect kind of fearful space to inhabit, uh, like incredible. an imaginary space within an actual real living space. And with a lot of you know, domestic space. below you as well. 